Welcome to this lecture on flow visualization. In this lecture, we're going to talk about three different types of flow visualization. These are streamlines, streak lines, and path lines. They're the three most common techniques that are used. There are other techniques, but the, these are the three most common. And then I'll talk about what they are physically and then show you how you would analyze them mathematically. Then we'll end the lecture with a few definitions that we use commonly in fluid mechanics. All right, let's start with an example. Take a look at your screen. Here we have an F-18 flying with two different kinds of fl uh, flow visualization techniques being used. You'll see, first of all, this kind of smoke that goes from this leading edge strake toward the tail here. That's done on purpose. It's not an accident. This is an example of a streak line. A streak line is a line that connects all the fluid particles that have passed through the same point in space. So all the fluid particles that went through this point picked up a little bit of smoke and then carried it further downstream. So that's an example of a streak line. The other technique that's used is you'll see on the surface of the aircraft all these little tufts of string that have been glued onto the surface of the aircraft. Those are giving the local velocity on the surface of the aircraft. So the, they're pointing in the direction of the local velocity vectors there. And if you draw a line that's everywhere, you know, you start at some tuft and then you I'm not going to do this very well, but let's say we start here and then we go through uh, that, that connects all these, um, that goes through each of those tufts and stays tangent to all the tufts. So the, the line is everywhere tangent to the tufts. That would trace out an example of a, a streamline. Okay, so two different techniques here, a streak line and a streamline. And we'll talk about this in more detail later in the lecture. I have actually a video of this aircraft, and I thought I'd show it and, and describe a little bit the motivation for why they were doing this uh, flow visualization. So let me see if I can pull that up. So here's the video. Uh, it may take a moment to load. All right, so what you see, if you look closely, you'll see on the vertical tail fin, it's vibrating. So they have that streak line, that smoke that goes along, and then it's it's causing the tail fin to vibrate back and forth. That was problematic at these high angles of attack. We'll play it again. These high angles of attack because what was happening was that vibration they were concerned would cause fatigue in that vertical tail fin. They didn't want that. So they were trying to understand what was causing it and what design features might eliminate it. We'll let that finish. And so they could see that it was a, a vortex coming off this leading edge here that was impinging on that vertical fin. And what they ended up doing, I think, to actually resolve the problem is they just mounted a big, you know, just a piece of uh, metal or composite material, I'm not sure it was, on the surface of the, the strake, it's the, that little kind of wing-like thing toward the front. And what that did is that broke up the vortex before it had a chance to get to the back part of the, the, tail, the vertical tail fin there. The thing about flow visualization is it gives you a really good insight into the flow physics, what's happening. So when you can see what's going on with the flow, it can give you a lot of insight as to what physical mechanisms are important and how you might change a design. So for example, in uh, the design of automobiles, let me just draw my automobile here, and this is a terrible picture of a car. But, uh, oops, excuse me. So let's say we're driving along, flow's coming in this way. Uh, one thing that happens with automobiles is you'll get recirculation flow, kind of like what I'm drawing here, where the flow comes back on itself, right? In these regions where the flow comes back on itself, this sort of vortex, it's called a recirculation zone. As far as drag is concerned on the vehicle, that's undesirable. Uh, it's a big wake region. It generally is relatively low pressure and it, um, results in a larger drag force acting on the vehicle. The car actually gets pushed back into that wake because of differences in air pressure. And so it's undesirable to have that. So in the design of vehicles and such, they'll do some flow visualization so they can quickly see if there are these recirculation regions and then make small design uh, feature changes to try to eliminate it. So flow visualization is done all the time. It just gives you quick insight as to what's going on and it can be used for you know, um, design of bodies moving through, um, through fluids. It's just a, an easy way to do things. All right, let's go ahead and get started. 
we're going to start with streamlines. Streamlines are the most common type of flow visualization technique. We're going to refer to them all the time in this course. In fact, it's probably one of the only types of flow visualization we'll refer to as we go through the course. Um, before we do that, let me just say a few words about the velocity fields that we'll start with. So we're going to say the velocity field uh, for the fluid is just u. So what I mean by that is just uh, let's say, I, let me draw this, the velocity field around this airfoil shape at the bottom here. So if I had some experimental technique, I could get what the velocity vectors are at each point. Right? I'm just going to draw a few of them. So let's say that the velocity looks something like this. So maybe the velocity vectors around that airfoil look like what I've done here. So what we have is at each point, there's some x, y, z here. I'll just draw the x and y. At each point, we have some velocity vector. Right? So to write out the velocity field, I'll use the symbol u. It's a vector. And it'll be a function of x, y, and z, because the velocities could be different at each point, like I've shown in that picture there with the airfoil. And it could also be a function of time. Right? Could it, it could be unsteady in the sense that uh, it's changing with time. Right? So it could be a function of position, and it can be a function of time. So that's what our velocity field looks like for our fluid velocity vectors. Now, what a streamline is, is a line that's everywhere tangent to, to the velocity uh, vectors. Let me write that down. Streamline is a line that is everywhere tangent to the velocity vectors. What I mean by that is, let me, let me just draw some streamlines and maybe it'll uh, seem a little more straightforward to you. Let's start here uh, with that velocity vector. I'm going to draw a line that's tangent to that velocity vector and then go to the next vector, keep it tangent, keep it tangent. Let's go to the next one here. I'm just drawing a line that's tangent to all these velocity vectors. I'll do this one. So those lines are all tangent to the velocity vector. So those would be streamlines. Now mathematically, the way we write that is if I zoom in on a velocity vector, let's say that's a velocity vector here, u. Well, here's the x component of that vector. I'm just going to do this in x, y coordinates, but you can do the same thing in three dimensions. So there's the x component, here's the y component of that velocity vector. That has a certain slope, right? Well, the, the streamline should have the same slope because it's tangent to the velocity vector. So the slope of the streamline right here, that same point should be dy over dx. Just That's the slope of the streamline just through that little point there. And we're saying that a streamline is everywhere tangent to the velocity vector, so they'll have the same slope at that point. So we'll have dy over dx for the streamline should equal uy over ux. So that's a differential equation describing the streamline. Presumably, from experimental measurements, we would get the ux and the uy, because we'd have measurements of the velocity field. And then if we wanted to calculate the streamlines, we could use that differential equation to solve for the slope of the streamline and then solve the differential equation to get the actual line. And you can do this in the other, other planes as well. This is in the xy plane. You could do it in the zx plane. So it would look like this in the end. And you could do it in the zy plane. And if you combine all those together into one form, it'll look like dx over ux equals dy over ui equals dz over uz. And you can mix and match those equations to figure out what the slope is in any of the three planes. So that's a streamline. The, the key thing to remember is a streamline is everywhere tangent to the velocity vectors. If you know that, then you should be able to figure out that the slopes are the same, you know, dy over dx equals ui over ux, and then just solve the differential equation using some math at that point. All right, um, let me draw a couple of streamlines here and then just say a few words, a few additional words. So let's say there's one streamline and here's another streamline. 
So let me ask you this, how, what's the velocity of the fluid across the stream line? So I want to know just in general, what kind of velocity would I have going across a stream line? Well, the answer is zero, because remember, this, the, the streamline's tangent to the velocity vectors, which means there is no component normal to the streamline. So there is no flow across the streamline. So you can never have any flow across those streamlines. What that means then is that any fluid that starts between two streamlines, sometimes we call it this a stream tube. Imagine um, streamlines that go all the way around to form a tube shape. So whatever comes into that stream tube will always be the same fluid that goes out through the st same uh, stream tube. So whatever blob of fluid, the yellow bit that goes in there, it'll be the same yellow bit that goes out because you can't have flow across the streamlines. Okay. Now another thing to make note of with streamlines is there's a, a special streamline called a stagnation streamline. So let me draw an airfoil shape and draw some streamlines going around it. This looks better than the one I drew before. Okay, so on that picture, the way I've drawn it here, this streamline right here is known as a stagnation streamline. Let me draw it in a different color. This one right there. And the reason for that is because at that point, we call that point a stagnation point. And then at that point, the velocity is zero. That the fluid, what's happening is the fluid's coming into that, that object and it slows down and it slows down and it just comes to rest on the surface of the object. And we call that a stagnation, a stagnation point. And then the streamline that leads into that point is called a stagnation streamline. So um, you'll hear the term stagnation point um, later in the course. Just be aware that a stagnation point is a point where the velocity goes to zero and the stagnation streamline is the streamline that goes into that stagnation point, okay? Now you might ask yourself, how do we get streamlines? You know, how, how would we get the velocity field? I said that, you know, to get the equation of the streamline, first you need to know the velocity field. How would you get the velocity field? Well, there are different techniques that we can use. The, the, the first of all, the poor man's way of doing it is just what we had on the picture starting off with. If you just glue little bits of yarn or little bits of thread onto the surface, then those bits of yarn will, have, will, will uh, flow in the same direction. So if I have a bit of yarn here, it's glued onto a surface, it's gonna point in the same direction as the local flow. So it's not gonna give you the magnitude of the velocity or the speed, but it'll at least give you the direction. And if you have the directions, then you can draw the streamlines because you just keep the streamline tangent to the velocity vectors. So gluing the little bits of thread onto the surface here gives you a way to get the streamlines on the surface of the aircraft. And there are other techniques similar to that. So sometimes people use paint or oil. And so when they put the paint or oil on the surface and the flow goes past it, the, it'll smear out on the surface and as it smears out, it'll, it'll go in the direction of the local velocity vectors. Another technique is to take chalk and put it in some water. And then as it flows along, the chalk will get deposited. And when the water evaporates, it just leaves the chalk behind. Very common techniques used for evaluating what the streamlines look like on the surface of an object. Okay, now that, those, those are kind of the poor man's techniques. The, uh, the rich man's technique, the expensive way of doing it is in the picture shown here. This is called particle image velocimetry is the technique. And the name is, I'll just highlight the name rather than write it out. So here, particle image velocimetry, or PIV for short. This technique's been around, um, it's usually used in research laboratories. It's been around for a few decades now. And the idea is this. First of all, you take your flow and you seed it with something. You seed it with some very small bits of paint. Uh, Titanium dioxide is very commonly used, but they're small, they're like, you know, on the order of a micron in size, really tiny. And the reason you make it very small is because you don't want the particles to settle out. You don't want them to be too buoyant and float up. And you want them to follow the streamlines of the flow. So if the flow has a, some curve, you know, sharp turn, you want the little bits of paint to follow that sharp turn. You don't want them to have too much inertia and just continue, you know, in a straight line. 
So you need little bits of paint in the flow. It's called seeding the flow. And then what you do is you, as you can see in the picture here, you use a laser and take that laser beam and uh, use some optics and make it into a light sheet. And then that light sheet shines into your flow with the paint particles. So the laser light will bounce off the paint particles and illuminate them. And what you do is you take a picture of that, uh, just a very short picture using a camera. So here, this represents the camera looking at that, uh, those illumin illuminated paint particles. And you take a picture at time t, just a very you know, s quick snapshot of the flow. And then a very short time later, you take another quick picture. And so you'll have two sets of dots that'll appear in your two photos. Let me, let me sketch this out for you. So let's say we take a picture at time t. I'll put that in blue. And our paint particles look like this. And then let me take another picture at time t plus delta t. Just a short time later, the paint particles may have moved a short distance, right? And then what we do is we connect the dots between them. And these are the displacement vectors. So the displacement vector will look like this. It'll be the position of the particles. At, you know what? Let me change the colors here. The, um, it'll, the displacement vectors will be the position of the particle at t plus delta t, kind of the last picture. And then you subtract out the position of the particles at time t. So that gives you the displacement of the particles. And then if you divide through by the time, that will starting to look like a derivative, right? If we make delta t, you know, take the limit as it goes to zero, then it becomes the velocity. Uh, of course, we don't let it go exactly to zero, but we make delta t a very small amount of time so that in the end, this becomes approximately the velocity at each of the points. Now, what I've described for you, to be, I, I have to confess, it's not exactly particle image velocimetry. What I've described for you there is called particle tracking velocimetry. It's a very close cousin to particle image velocimetry. There are just some, some technical details that are different. Um, for our purposes, you can just consider them to be the same thing. But they, in reality, they're a little bit different. But it's a, it's a method to get not only the direction of the velocity vectors, but here you can actually get the magnitude. You can get the speed at each point in the flow field. So PIV or PTV, whichever one you want to use, um, very common in research labs nowadays. Okay, And actually, we have um, PIV equipment in our fluid mechanics laboratory that you'll use in one of your labs. All right, so that's particle image velocimetry. And again, it's used to get the velocity field. And then once we have that velocity field, we can draw streamlines by keeping the slope of the streamline everywhere tangent to the velocity vectors. Now let me move on to the second method of flow visualization that we'll talk about. And that's called uh, streak lines. Now a streak line is a line that connects all the fluid particles that have passed through the same point in space at some previous time. The best way to visualize this is with what you see on the screen here on the left is imagine injecting some dye into a flow, okay? So let's say I'm injecting some dye into this point. Let's call it x naught, some initial point, x naught, y naught, z naught. And when the fluid goes through that in dye injection point, it picks up some, some red dye. And so you'll see, you know, this is one fluid particle that's passed through that point. Here's another one that's passed through that point at a, an earlier time. So all this, this whole red line is a set of fluid particles that have passed through this point x naught at some previous time. So if this one, for example, passed through at time t1, this one passed through at time t2. Okay. Uh, to see a more realistic picture, here on the right-hand side, we have a guy in a wind tunnel with a smoke wand. So this wand here injects some smoke into the flow, and they're just visualizing the flow over this vehicle. So you can see a streak line that's passing over the vehicle surface there. It's not Technically, it's not a streamline. It's technically it's a streak line because it's tracing out the line. Of, it's tracing out all the fluid particles that have passed right next to that nozzle where it's injecting smoke. Now, to get the equation of a streak line, it'll be the velocity vector, which presumably we get that from some some technique, right? Like I talked about PIV or some other technique. The velocity vector we know is just the time rate of change of the 
position of the fluid particles, just dx dt. That's just you know basic uh, how you get a velocity from a position, right? So that's the differential equation that we would use to get what the the equation of the the streak lines would be. We need some sort of an initial condition to solve that uh, differential equation. The initial condition is this. Let me just write it out and then I'll discuss it. So here's our initial condition. It, what it says is that the position of the fluid particles that have passed through that point, so x naught is our point here. So we want um, the fluid particle that passes through that point at some previous time t naught. Now here for a streak line, the t naught varies. T naught is different for each fluid particle because each fluid particle passes through that dye injection point at different times. You can see that here. This fluid particle went through that injection point at T1. This fluid particle went through that injection point at T2, and so on and so forth, right? So here, the T naught, the, the time when it went through the point X naught will vary for each particle, okay? And then if we solve that differential equation, we'll get the streak line through that point at an instant in time T. So here, T, is at a particular time. It's the streak line at that time. And the T knots vary, but the T stays constant. It's, it's a little hard to think about. You'll have to, you'll have to sit down and, and kind of puzzle on it for a little bit. It helps to do some examples so you can sort of see it a little better. So that's a streak line. It's just a different technique. Gives you a little different information. For example, um, you may be interested, let's say uh, when the Chernobyl power plant uh, had its disaster, right? Radioactivity was released into the atmosphere. Um, in order to see what other countries would be affected by the radioactivity, it would be it would it was helpful to draw streak lines passing right past the Chernobyl power plant, right? So you have the atmospheric air and the winds blowing past it, and you want to see all the all the air particles that have passed over Chernobyl, and you want to see where they end up at some later time. That would be a streak line that you'd be interested in there, right? Because you want to see all the fluid particles that have all passed Chernobyl. Here, instead of dye. For Chernobyl, it'd be radioactive markers that you were tracking rather than the dye, okay? So it's just a different technique. Um, it's different uh, than a streamline, okay? In experimental you know, studies of fluid mechanics, streak lines are used all the time. In computational and analytical work, streamlines are discussed more frequently, but in experimental work, streak lines are used uh, very frequently. Let's go into the uh, let's go on to the last technique. The last one is called path line. Now a path line is a line showing where an individual, a single fluid particle moves as a function of time. And the best way to think about a path line is a long exposure photograph. So let's say um, I want to track how the surface of a river moves. I could go down to the river and drop in, let's say, a ping pong ball. You know, go to, go to a bridge, drop a ping, ping pong ball in, and then set a camera with a long exposure photograph, right? So that the, the shutter's open, and then as that ping pong ball moves, I'm tracing out a path line. I'm tracing out where a particular particle, in this case the ping pong ball, moves as a function of time. So that would be a path line. It's different than a streak line, because a streak line is a bunch of fluid particles that you're connecting together. A path line is an individual fluid particle, and you're just tracing its motion over time. So the picture on the right kind of shows this. It's actually a long exposure photograph of uh, fire, and the, the glowing things here are embers. They're in, like a little single ember, and you're seeing it's traced out movement. So that's the path line of that ember. Here's a path line of another ember and such. So path lines are lines tracing out the movement of an individual particle, where streak lines are tracing out the movement of a bunch of particles passing through a point. So to get the equation of a path line, it actually looks almost identical to the equation, the technique we use to get the equation for the streak line. We have the velocity field. That's related to the time rate of change of the fluid particle positions. And we have An initial condition, it all looks exactly the same as what we had for the streak line. You can sort of see that up above. But in this case, 
the t varies. Not the t naught. You'll see up for the streak line, it's the t naught varies. So here, what you're getting is a streak line through the point x naught at an instant in time, and the t naught varies. Down here for the path line, what we're doing is we're getting the equation for a single fluid particle that passes through this point at a single individual time. So t naught in this case is fixed because that one particle passes through that point at an instant time. It's just one particle. And then you see its movement as time changes. So t varies and t naught is fixed. So t naught fixed there, but for a path line, t is fixed. Again, it's a little hard to absorb, you know, just hearing it for the first time. You have to think about it a little bit. But how you solve for the path line and how you solve for the streak line look almost identical. The only difference is which varies, T naught or T. Again, T naught varies for a streak line because there are many fluid particles and they all pass through that point X naught at different T naughts, different times. Whereas for a path line, it's only a single T naught because it's only one fluid particle that we care about. And then we trace its motion over different times t. So you have to think about it for a while. And again, uh, a path line just is a different technique than a streamline or a streak line. It just gives us another way to view a fluid. You might be interested in, let's say we're interested in a, a weather bloom, seeing where weather bloom moves uh, over time. There it would be a path line that you're interested in because you're interested in that one weather bloom and you want to see where it moves as a function of time. So it's a path line that you're interested in there. All right. Um, let's see if I, oh, one last thing about the different techniques here. Now, in general, streamlines, streak lines, and path lines can be, all be different. They don't have to be the same thing. They're physically different things, so they can, gen, in general, be different. However, if you're dealing with a steady flow, and a steady flow means that one that doesn't vary with time, all three are the same. So let's write that down. So in general, streamlines, streak lines, and path lines are different. They're just physically different things, so, so they can be different, right? But uh, however, for a steady flow, This is one where the, the velocity is not a function of time. All three are the same. So if you're dealing with the steady flow, it doesn't matter. Path line, streak line, streamline, they're all the same thing. You solve for one, you have the other two, right? They're all exactly the same. Uh, so, you know, a lot of times you'll hear people look at this photo on the screen here on the right. Say, oh, look at that. You know, there's a, there's a streamline. Technically, it's a streak line, but if it's a steady flow, you know, it, it doesn't really matter. All three are the same. Okay, so uh, don't be too hard on your friends if they accidentally say, oh, look at that streamline. Uh, they're not, not exactly right, but they're not exactly wrong either. Okay. All right. Um, and I encourage you to take a look at some of the examples and separate videos so you can see how to solve some of these equations. Okay. Now, before we end this lecture, there are a few definitions I want to talk about that are important ones. We're going to use this terminology frequently in the course. First one is steady versus unsteady. And I've, I've referred to this term steady um, a bit earlier in the lecture. So a steady flow is one that's not a function of time. So steady means that nothing Whatever you're interested in, which is the three dots here, I'll, I'll just use three dots. It's you know velocity, temperature, whatever. Um, there is no time derivative. The time derivative is zero. It's not a function of time. Okay. So um, that means steady and unsteady. Just means that it is a function of time. So another way to write this is that uh, it's not a function of time, whereas down here it is a function of time. Okay, so that's steady versus unsteady. Most of this class will deal with steady flows, but you know, unsteady flows are pretty common and very important, so 
and we'll do a little bit with unsteady flows. They're a little bit harder to work with, but, and that's why we deal with steady most of the time. Um, but you should just be aware, aware of the terminology. The next one is flow dimension. The flow dimension is related to the number of spatial dimensions, like x, y, z, required to describe the flow. So for example, if we have a 0D flow, an example of that would be like uh, the velocity is just a function of time, or velocity is a constant. There's no x, y, or z in that. Okay, so that's that would be like 0D. 1D flow, an example of that would be like u is a function of t and x, or that's if it's unsteady, or if it's steady, u would just be a function of x. It's just one spatial dimension that's required, okay? Let me give you a 3D example. So for 3D, um, the velocity could be a function, let me use a different coordinate system, r, theta, and z, that's cylindrical coordinates. And if it's unsteady, time would be a factor. So I had three spatial dimensions there, right? Radius, the angular position theta, and then z. Or if it's steady, it would just be three spatial dimensions and not time, right? So the, the flow dimensionality just depends on the number of spatial dimensions required to describe that flow. So you'll hear, oh, here's a 1D flow, this flow's two-dimensional, this flow's three-dimensional. So you know, oh, how many spatial dimensions are, are needed to describe that flow. Okay, the next one is uniform versus non-uniform. So this is easiest to show with a picture. This velocity field, let me put this in the, oh, this is the y direction here. Here's the x direction. So this flow is uniform in the y direction because there's no variation in the y direction. So uniform means that there's no, there's no variation in a particular direction. So here we have a, uh, a flow that's uniform in the y direction, okay, or it's constant in the y direction. Non-uniform would mean that it does vary. So here, for example, it's non-uniform in the y direction. So you'll hear that term used frequently as well. Oh, the uniforms, uh, the flow is uniform in the z direction. Um, you know, it's uniform in the x direction. That kind of thing. Okay. And then the last one we'll talk about is laminar versus turbulent flow. And I just have a couple of pictures associated with this. I think you've all heard the term laminar flow and turbulent flow before. Let me just, let me write it out first, what I mean by this, and then we'll look at the pictures. A laminar flow, the word laminar comes from the, the word lamina, which just means layers. So the flow is actually moving kind of in layers that don't mix very much. So uh, I'll just write down some words here. So flow in layers, um, little mixing. very organized kind of flow. This, you generally get laminar flows for viscous fluids at low speeds. Okay, And then the opposite of that at the other end of the spectrum is turbulent flow. So turbulent flow is seemingly random or chaotic. It's, it's, not, it's not exactly chaotic, but it looks chaotic, looks random. Uh, you get vortices or eddies. Of different sizes and you get a lot of mixing some good mixing in fact when they try to mix different kinds of fluids together turbulent flow is desire desirable uh, you get a lot of mixing going on or if you're trying to get a lot of heat transfer from a surface um, you, you generally want turbulent flow close to that surface because you get lots of mixing going on it, it picks up that energy from the surface and carries it away you get good heat transfer. So with turbulent flow, you get all these kind of vortices or eddies that are moving. It looks, it looks random or chaotic, um, lots of mixing going on. So very different from laminar flow. And there's actually a region in between called transitional flow. Transitional flow is just has elements of both. 
In fact, it'll be laminar for a little bit of time, and then it seems to randomly go into turbulence, and then it'll go back to laminar flow and then turbulent again. It just sort of seems to switch back and forth between the two. So it has elements of both. It's a very hard region to analyze because it seems so random. Most of our analysis is either at the laminar extreme or the turbulent extreme. Okay. And so let's refer to the pictures here. On the left-hand side, you can see where some smoke has been injected at this point. So it's like a, a, what kind of uh, flow visualization technique is being used here? Streak line. Good. I assume everyone said streak line. Great. So, so here it starts with the laminar flow. You can see nice layers of fluid, not much mixing going on. And then it goes into this transitional flow where it's starting to look a little bit turbulent. It still looks kind of laminar. And then, boom, it gets all chaotic and random looking here. This is where it becomes turbulent. You see lots of vortices going on, lots of mixing. Uh, a lot less structure going on here than, than over here. And then on the right-hand side is the same sort of thing. This is actually a, a pipe flow. The bottom picture is laminar, the top picture is turbulent. And I'm not sure whether the flow is going right to left or left to right, but you can see down here there are little st uh, streaks from the particles here. The flow down here in the laminar pipe, it's going in nice layers. Um, the layers aren't mixing very much. You can sort of see that from the image. Whereas up in here, in the turbulent one, you're getting these uh, eddy or, or board, vortical structures going on in here. So a lot more mixing going on in that pipe flow. And the difference between whether it's laminar or turbulent actually has a huge impact on how you would model the flow and what kind of behavior it has. So it's important to know. So we'll use the term laminar and um, turbulent frequently. Transitional, we'll talk about briefly with pipe flows, but we won't spend too much time on that. All right, <clears throat> I think that's everything I want to say about um, flow visualization. I encourage you to spend a little bit of time on the internet taking a look at different flow visualization techniques. There's a whole research area dedicated to different methods used to visualize flows. And there's some beautiful videos and beautiful photographs. In fact, there's even a competition through uh, APS, the American Physical Society, where they, um, the Fluid Dynamics Division, where they have a contest every year to see who can produce the most beautiful flow visualization um, images. So do a search on that. It's really some neat stuff. And then also make sure you go through the examples so you can see how uh, we calculate, you know, the, the quantitative side of flow visualization, how we can calculate some of these things. All right, we'll go ahead and end it there.